Okay, uh, buenos dias, good morning all. Let's uh, start our press conference. We will, we will start with uh, cyber news. Hi. Um, hey. Oh, yeah, I will ask the question in English, but then I will like... Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Marrero's concerns about the fiscal plan. He, say, he said that the governor has not uh, had uh, yet an opportunity to review it, and he reserves the, the right to take any measures uh, he deems necessary. And second, I want to have a reaction about um, the government's uh, concern about the cream and they they saying that you are not um, validating the the numbers they put in the in their in their plan. That's two teams. So I'll I'll uh, start with the first question on our interactions with the governor on the fiscal plans. We have been working uh, with and collaborating with the governor and his, his team from the very beginning. So we've had numerous discussions about the plans. The plans are not a surprise. Um, certainly, we don't always agree on everything. And, and uh, as the governor reviews the final version, the, the governor not, may not agree with, with everything. But, We've had uh, numerous discussions about the plan, so they're very much a collaborative effort, although we, we don't always agree on everything, as, as is, is evident. And on the CRIM, um, Herman, is that, you want to speak to that? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. Uh, on the CRIM fiscal plan, we um, basically did follow the provisions of the CW, or Commonwealth fiscal plan, the phase out on the transfers to the tax equalization fund is something that uh, has been in the CW fiscal plans for the last several years. It's not anything new. And uh, to the extent that that phase out continued in the Commonwealth fiscal plan that was certified back, back in January, the CRIM fiscal plan that was certified today merely continues that same uh, phase out. Obviously, you cannot expect to have uh, the Commonwealth fiscal plan saying one thing and the CRIM fiscal plan saying the other. Uh, and as I said, you know, this isn't anything new. On the other hand, I want to bring up to the attention that um, the municipalities uh, will be receiving additional assistance with regards to the plan of adjustment and uh, an equivalent amount that was um, uh, proposed there, uh, equivalent to 40 point something percentage of, uh, of what municipalities otherwise contribute to the state uh, debt redemption fund. So the municipalities will be receiving additional uh, funding beginning this fiscal year 23 that was not received in previous years. Uh, for the translation, uh, I suggest that Herman answers back his question in Spanish in regard to the question that David uh, answered. We have been working uh, close together with the governor as well as with his team. Uh, therefore, for us, is we understand that it shouldn't be a surprise for him at this point. You know, what is the position of the board? and where the difference lie. Uh, we believe that this process should be a collaborative process and that uh, we could reach some uh, middle ground. Um, and we always keep in mind the governor's uh, point of view as well as his teams. But at the end, uh, there could be some differences and we are always available to talk and work on them. And if Herman could always ask the other part in Spanish. Thank, sure, thank you. What I was commenting was a disposition uh, planted uh, by Mr. Morrow, the interim governor, related to the reductions in the transfers that the central government makes to the cream for the benefit of the municipalities. What he, the plan, certified plan from the cream, as was certified some minutes ago, reflects the continuation of a policy or a practice that 
was already adopted in the fiscal plan, from the cream fiscal plan years ago, and it's a uh, reflection of the same position that was adopted in the certify in the central government fiscal plan in January of this year. And we cannot have uh, contrary or opposing positions in the uh, central government uh, fiscal plan and the cream's fiscal plan. And that corresponds to the gradual, the phase out of the transfer of the central government, as well as in the contributions from the municipalities to the a assets payment. And on the other hand, and I shall mention but that under Act 53, and as a result as well of the plan of adjustment of the central government, the municipalities will begin to receive an additional money funding that was not received in previous years, limited, limiting its use only to the management of solid waste and recycling program, but it's a new fund that and they didn't receive before. Thank you. Uh, Next question will be Bocero and then Kevin Mead. Yes, hi, hello. I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, I would like you to recap uh, the information you gave about getting a new executive director, if you could please. I would like to know if you've already interviewed any candidates and at what point do you think that position will be filled? And I have another question as well. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, a as I said, we are well underway with the interview with the uh, search process. Uh, we are interviewing candidates. Um, I can't give you a specific date on when we will uh, will have an executive director, but we have excellent candidates, and we expect to have uh, an executive director soon. As I said, I can't tell you exactly when that will be, but the, the search is, is uh, well underway. So in Spanish, the process of recruitment the process, the recruitment process is quite way underway. We have interviewed many candidates, and we have candidates who are very strong for the position. We cannot give a date, exact date, of when we're going to have the executive director, but we can indeed say that we should have such position filled uh, near the, in, very soon given where we're at the, pro the, the, we're the process. I have is regarding uh, PREPA's plan and also the amount that it's, it's being increased in the cost of water. I would like to know if you took into consideration what, what's this going to mean for the people who have to pay for this and all the increases that uh, Puerto Rico is dealing with right now. And if, is, if this is something that matters to you, being that the water is going to be more expensive now. Alejandro. Uh, th thank you. Um, the, the rate increases reflected in the uh, Prasa Fiscal Plan are the result of a process followed by Prasa um, as required by law. So um, process enabling law requires them to um, uh, hire an, an examining officer. That examining officer um, develops a report, conducts public hearings, um, and, that's, and, and then the recommendation from the examining uh, officer is then presented to the process governing board for their approval. Um, and the, 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 the specific um, adjustments reflected in the fiscal plan come from, are, are the result of that process or they were proposed by PRASA um, to the board. Um, so we relied on process, uh, process and, and, and also the reality is that a lot of those uh, adjustments, as I mentioned in my presentation, are related to macroeconomic factors, just simply increases in the cost of operation, which uh, just requires PRASA to make those modest adjustments, which enable them to have the funding necessary to, rep uh, to finance their operations without having to reduce investing in the system, which is what they had attempted to do in prior years, right, and led to the deficient state of the system. So this is really, um, to sort of summarize, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's the product of process own process. It's a proposal from PRASA. Um, 
and it is designed to really allow Prasa to continue investing it in its system. Alejandro, por la importancia del tema, puedes repetirla en español, por favor. Given the importance of the topic, can you repeat it in Spanish? In essence, the process, the adjustments in the rates contemplated in the fiscal plan, it's a product of a process by law in which PRASA must follow to determine any increase in the rates. That process requires the hiring and examining officer and requires that the officer develops a report, conducts public hearings, and have a recommendation to the governing board, to the process governing board, who implements the adjustment. So what it reflects, the fiscal plan reflects, is process proposals that is a consequence of that process. I would like to underline that part of the reason of why those adjustments are required is because there has been some increase in the operation cost, electricity, chemical increases, and many have to do with macroeconomic factors or global, global in its nature, like the invasion of Russia into Ukraine, and also the inflation, the cost of living has increased. And what it attempts to do is to assure that we don't go back to the old measures, old practices, where they didn't have enough income or revenues to finance their operations, and they will sacrifice maintenance of the system. And that's what caused the degrading process of the system where there is a 65% loss of water because the system cannot manage it. So the increase in the rates, they, they attempt, they, their purpose is to balance in a modest manner year after year to make sure the funds are available to finance the system without sacrificing the needed capital investments of this for the system. Thank you, Alexander. Next, we have Kevin Mead. Just a few questions related on uh, related to PREPA on, on timing matters, nothing uh, regarding any economic terms that you may be discussing. Um, I'm just wondering if, if you're, you anticipate uh, seeking the available one month extension to the mediation period. Uh, secondly, is the often stated goal of having PREPA out of restructuring by the end of 2022 still viable? And, and lastly, if you decide to litigate the PREPA bond security issue, how long may that lengthen uh, PREPA's Title III process? So let me start with those, and uh, Kevin, I'll have to have you repeat the last one, which I didn't hear. So one is uh, the status of an extension. Um, we're not thinking about an extension um, now. I, I uh, and if, if we were, I, I probably couldn't uh, really, uh, really talk about that because of the mediation. Uh, and then the, the second question was uh, whether PREPA will be out of of Title III by the end of the year. We certainly hope so, and this, the schedule we're on is, is consistent with that. Um, but uh, again, because of the mediation confidentiality, I can't be um, specific at that, about that either. What, what was the last question? The last question, can, can you give any sense on, if, if you decide to litigate the, the PREPA bond issue, can you give any sense of how long that may extend the Title III proceedings, or, or would it extend the Title III? Proceedings could it be done in the same time period that you just mentioned by the end of the year? I think it's. Um, we're hoping to have a, a plan that we can propose and get confirmed without litigation. So I, I really don't want to speculate on what would happen with uh, with litigation. There are lots of different possibilities of what the implications of that would be. Okay. Thank I would you. add, generally speaking, you know, litigation is probably inconsistent with resolving this uh, quickly, getting it done this year. And I agree with David. You know, we really want to try to get it done this year. All right, well, thanks both. All right, we have to, um, Telemundo here. Yes, good morning. I think Mari Carmen's question is still unanswered about if you thought about the people. 
regarding Prasa. Uh, I know you saw, you told us that uh, was a process you know that Prasa conducted and uh, you just received that, uh, but I think that's still uh, that question is still standing. And also, uh, you you said that operating expenses in Prasa will be will go up during the next new, uh, few years, including payroll. And I don't I don't see uh, any objection or any. Uh, comment to to that reality that you know expenses will go up a uh, you know like for the next five years uh, why is that why, why is the board okay with that and uh, also uh, I have another question go ahead uh, yeah. I think it's better to say that and answer in Spanish uh, yes yes so the first question I think that the first thing would be uh, uh, at the end of the day, I think it's more a question for PRASA because PRASA is the one that goes through the process of determining uh, the rates. Uh, in this case, we what we are adopting is the propo is process proposal, which is a product of that process. So the assessment of the reasonability of those uh, rates is part of the process that took place uh, at the PRASA level. So I think that is a question that's more directed towards PRASA, nonetheless. We have to look at the other side of the coin. What is the eff the negative effect in the uh, citizen, the quality of life, that there is not enough uh, funds to maintain that system? So the people suffer from uh, water quality, which is under what is understand, which is understood to be uh, healthy. People suffer when the quality is low. People suffer when the pumping system is failing, and um, they don't have water for a prolonged period or repeatedly. And all of that also has to do with having the, the availability of the funds to finance those uh, maintenance uh, works. And there are some funds available, and the plan uh, mentions some a great amount of funds that are entering the system, and it, it is foreseen that they could uh, be used throughout the years. It could be December throughout these years. Nonetheless, that doesn't mean that PRASA has to ensure that uh, it has the capacity at all times to react to anything, any damages that could happen. And as it moves towards uh, from um, reactive towards a proactive uh, maintenance, it needs to have the funds for that to happen. So. Uh, the it is important to also look at what is the negative effect of not having of not ensuring that Prasa could invest in the system. On the other hand, uh, related to the uh, the increase in expenditures or in expenses, what it is being reflected is that the ex expenses is not predicted that the OPEX uh, will reduce, but that they will incrementally. Increase and as I mentioned, that has many reasons. Uh, some of them are totally out of the process control. But the important thing is that in the first place, the fiscal plan uh, projects uh, some balanced budgets. So even with the projected uh, increase in ex in expenses, they still go in par with the uh, budget. And on the other hand, uh, the the particular increase in payroll and salaries uh, has it comes not merely just for the sake of increasing the salaries but that prasa for many years has tried to increase their workmanship to reach some level that that are enough to provide a service a decent service and so it's had uh, many problems because, as we all know, the salaries, maybe in some areas, they're not competitive with the market, and then the employees leave. So we, throughout the years, we asked Prasa that first they take uh, capacity studies so that they can determine the areas that need the most uh, recruitment and how some areas could be covered with internal transfers and how could they increase their workmanship. They took, they had that study done and then the other had another study where they compared the process salaries with the PRASA in the market. And that looks to 
make some salaries in Prasa, compare them or make them equivalent to some in the market with the intention to re to retain the current talent so that you don't have that flea of talent. And this includes uh, critical employees like electromechanics and plant operators and also to bring additional employees that decide between going to the U.S. and NTT elsewhere or to be in the private sector. In this case, Prasa, through the uh, capacity study, has identified those positions that are important. So as they have those um, revenues available, what the fiscal planning is establishing is that it's important it's important for the operational efficiency of your system that you make those recruitments and it is being feasible, made feasible. Now, what the fiscal plan also requires is that you take advantage of that opportunity, that opportunity is taken advantage of to establish some performance guidelines so that we, one could ensure that those clients, those employees are, that those employees are, are, uh, that they're being provided the tools to uh, effectively perform and that PRASA is also receiving a benefit from those employees. Next question will be Medina. You abstain in the voting for PRITCO. I would like to know why. How do you explain what was being stated here with respect to a series of properties that have been abandoned, forsaken, that could be dangerous, that they want to de be demolish. You've been there. Are you responsible in some way for that, for what happened in Pritco with respect to these properties? Number one, the reason that I recuse myself from the voting with respect to the Pritco is particularly, remember, I was the director of Pritco for four years, 2013 to 2017. I was very proud to what we achieved with respect to the financials. We were paying for the bonds, and we even increased the occupancy of the buildings during that period. Therefore, since I signed many things and I participated in many routinely activities of the company for Pritco, a decision that I made with this made when when I started the board to avoid conflict of interest or the perception of the conflict of interest, any discussions or conversations with respect to Pritco, especially voting, that I would be I would abstain. In terms of the buildings, as we know. Pritco has been operated since 1940s. It's one of the most precious jewels in the crown in terms of um, development and execution, even its current status. Let me give you. Let me give me a second. I want to give you numbers about the properties since you asked for it. Or you ask about it. Page eight. Thank you. And by the way, this is the first time I see this presentation because when we talk about Pritco, we leave it at the last point of the agenda. And then I leave the meeting so I don't participate. So to avoid changing anybody's perspective because of the, what I know about Prico, there is a graph. I don't see it here. That tells you the amount of buildings that, have, that are operating in a positive manner. And we have many buildings that are working. Honeywell's office that they were built during my tenure, General Electric plant, circuit break, industrial circuit breakers, the plant in Sartorius, Sartorius it belongs to Pritco, 
Cooper Vision. Then when you go to from San Juan to Ponce, you see a global plant for structures. They all belong to Pritka. Likewise, you have many buildings that have been rented for a long time and the owner they don't have the capital to fix everything. So we must be realistic. Puerto Rico, during my period, my tenure, it, we were entering bankruptcy, and currently we are just getting out of the bankruptcy. So therefore, it is not necessary. That owner doesn't necessarily, or the administration has the capitalization for the square feet in Puerto Rico to be able to sustain, to main, give the maintenance to the building, to the standard that we're looking for. Therefore, that's why the presentation is talking about providing funds to Pritco to improve the infrastructure. We also know that there are buildings that were, were operating in the 50s, in the 60s, the 70s, etc., that actually the, the, they are not to be used anymore. The use, maybe they have a structural problem, or maybe they are not useful for business. We've also seen a depression in manufacturer numbers, and that has a correlation with demand with respect to the buildings for manufacture. And those buildings, with time, they have been come run down. When we were in Pritco, we didn't have the money to destroy the structures at their useful period. Their life cycle had ended. So we focused on new products. And this is a report, I've never seen it. This is the first time I see it. It provides a chance and strength to the company and provide alternatives on how to improve the infrastructure in terms of building through Puerto Rico. Although I don't find the page, I recommend you see the number of buildings that are operating and that are leased. I think it is we are at a 70%. When you see the total of buildings, it is a very low percentage of the ones that its life cycle have, has ended. I'm very proud. And I want to tell Javier Bayon, I want to congratulate him because of his action in Pritco. I believe he's a good leader and he's yeah, doing well, the right thing. The question will be John Marino. John, go ahead. Um, about the involvement of the oversight board and the tax reform process, including the Act 154 substitute and other measures, which are supposed to cost about six to seven hundred million annually. And I'm asking because I know the board had requested a seat on the uh, governor's tax reform working group, and not sure whether that was ever granted or not. I had a little trouble hearing the question because it was kind of cutting cutting in and out. Um, Can know. you repeat it, John, please? Yeah, hi, is this better? I'm sorry. I'm just wondering about the impact, whether you, you've had any input on the tax reform and the Act 154 um, uh, replacement and other, other measures that are expected to cost up to 700 million annually. I know the board had asked for a seat on the tax reform working group. I have another question as well, but I'll leave that there. I heard you that time, thank you. Um, so we have not been involved in the discussions. We're just learning about this, um, this now, and we'll have thoughts as we, as we learn more about it. I, I like okay, to, I'm add, I like to add something yeah, to that. Um, sure. Andrew uh, Biggs and I had uh, a meeting with the Secretary of Treasury yesterday, where he shared with us uh, some of the high-level details of what was achieved in terms of uh, the creditability issue on 154. And uh, I believe that uh, the position that US Treasury has taken with respect to the Puerto Rico proposal 
is uh, quite favorable in order to continue the process. But I think that's a beginning, not an end. Uh, we look forward to continue working with uh, Puerto Rico Treasury uh, to receive their, their input in terms of um, which way they want to modify all the different uh, incentive laws, whether it's Act 60 or Act 73 or Act 135. These are the different tax in incentive laws that, that will be affected by this uh, decision. But uh, it is, I think, a great date for Puerto Rico in terms of the willingness of U.S. Treasury to uh, help us come out of that 154 regime. Uh, in addition to that, if you look at the fiscal plan, the fiscal plan actually reduces uh, the collections of uh, Act 154 revenue from uh, rough numbers about two billion to a little over one, maybe one and a quarter. Um, so that actually provides some um, space for Puerto Rico Treasury to maneuver. Uh, because these companies will need to transition and there will be winners and losers. Of course, each company, as I'm sure you're well aware, uh, does their taxation in different ways. They have different circumstances. Some are global in nature, some maybe are, uh, you know, U.S.-based and so forth. So as the changes get implemented, each company will have to assess whether to remain under the current regime without creditability or to move to the new regime with the uh, guidelines that U.S. Treasury has provided uh, Hacienda here in Puerto Rico to move forward. Uh, Herman? If I may, sure, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, I want to clarify that the Act 154 proposal is something different to the tax reform that, uh, that the executive branch has been working on. We have participated in meetings with the Department of Treasury regarding the Act 154 uh, proposal. We are uh, evaluating certain information that they have shared with us in terms of uh, figuring out what the cost may be of the proposal that the executive branch is working on. It's still not a, a bill filed with the legislature, but we have had, we have had access to that uh, to that document, then we're working on it. In terms of the tax reform bill that the Secretary of the Treasury shared with the governor, I think a week ago or two weeks ago, we did receive that particular document today at uh, approximately nine o'clock in the morning. We will be reviewing it and working on it as well. Thank you. Next question, John. You have one more, I think. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. One more question. Yeah, it's uh, regarding, I'm just wondering if you can uh, discuss the practical impact or potential practical impact of the First Circuit CPI ruling that found the um, board's um, 11th Amendment sovereign immunity in Puerto Rico's was abrogated by PROMESA. Uh, the board has said it agrees with the dissent of Judge Lind. Uh, yes, I can say a couple of things about- of enormous consequences. I'm, I'm just wondering if we could discuss the yeah. I missed yeah, I missed the end. You cut out at the end, but I think I got I think I got your question, which is the First Circuit ruling that came out um, yesterday. Uh, a panel of of the of the First Circuit, three judge panel um, ruled in that case. It was a two to one decision um, with a dissent. We do agree with the the dissent. We have asked the entire First Circuit to reconsider. Um, the case, we've asked for what's known, uh, as, as you know, um, as en banc review, and we're hopeful that the case will, um, will get reversed in en banc review. The one thing that I would say, in addition to that, is simply that this is not an issue that just matters for the oversight board. It's a matter, it's an issue that matters for all of Puerto Rico. Um, if, there's not sovereign immunity in this situation. There won't be sovereign immunity in other situations with other Puerto Rico public officials. And so there really is a lot at stake, and we are very hopeful that the full First Circuit will, will overturn the ruling. Thank you, Chairman. I think we don't have more questions. Okay, well, we, we will finish this press conference. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.